Hi, I'm Michaela, and in this video, I'll be showing how we can perform pattern matching on sensor data with KDB AI. And before we dive into the example, I just want to mention, if you want to follow along with this video, you'll need to do two things. The first one is to sign up for a free KDB AI account. You can go to kdb.ai to get access and just click the sign up button in the top right hand corner. Once signed up, you'll have your own free KDB AI database where you can connect to. And if you'd like some more details on that sign up process and to find out more about what the screen shows once you're logged in, you can check out the video linked below. The second thing you'll need is a link to the example and data set I'm using, and this is available on our GitHub. And you can get there by clicking the link on Learning Hub. You'll see it pops up here with a button to download on GitHub. That's it, that's all you need. So let's get stuck into the example. We'll start by understanding what we mean when we say pattern matching and, and why we might need it. So collecting and analyzing time series data is really fundamental across many enterprises. And in this example, we're gonna look at one such use case, gathering sensor readings in a manufacturing plant. So if we take the scenario where an event occurs, like a breakdown of machinery, how could we retrieve all historical time series that might match that pattern, for example? Well, that's where this example can help. We can take our sensor readings in, we can do some pre-processing and signal cleaning, then we can transform this data into an embedded format. There's different kinds of embeddings we can use for time series data, and we'll talk about them a little bit later. And after storing these embeddings in KDB AI, we can perform pattern matching using a similarity search service. And this matching capability is instrumental in a wide array of manufacturing scenarios like quality control, process optimization, and predictive maintenance. Now let's get into the example to see how we can do this using KDB AI. First off, we've got some setup steps to do. So I'm gonna scroll down to those and run these cells. We're importing some libraries such as matplotlib that's gonna help with visualization later on, as well as KDB AI underscore client, which is how we can talk to our KDB AI database. I'm gonna set some filters on warnings and define some helper functions. And then we're ready to load our sensor data. So the data set we've taken is from Kaggle, so you can access the original data set here. And it's a water pump data set. And once you've extracted this file, you should see a sensor.csv file and you'll be able to load that in. So we'll do that now using read CSV and load it in as a pandas data frame. And then once we take a look at it, once loaded in, we can see it's got 52 sensor columns along the top, as well as a machine status and a timestamp here on the left. So these are results of 52 sensors on a water pump um, that were gathered over the period of six months. And for the purposes of the rest of this sample, we're just gonna take a look at the first one here, uh, just for simplicity when we're making our embeddings. But of course you could uh, combine and use multiple sensors um, to create your embeddings as well. Okay, so to start off, we're gonna do some pre-processing like dropping duplicates, removing columns we don't need, converting our timestamp to a daytime format, and just removing any NAN values. We'll reset our index, and now we've got our cleaned data frame ready to use here. Okay, as I said, we're gonna just take a look at the first one. Now that machine status column I mentioned, we're gonna use that and just take a look at anywhere machine status said it was broken and then plot this using some matplotlib visualization. And we'll see over the six month period, how the sensor value uh, generally performed. So we can see it generally oscillates around 2.5, but there was some huge drop offs along the way. And they also coincide with these machine statuses of broken. Okay, so this is the data we're gonna create embeddings for and then run our pattern search on. So to create our embeddings, we're going to use a combination of windowing um, and normalization. Um, now, this is a, quite a simple approach and there's no need here for complex modeling or domain specific expertise, but this could be replaced with any form of embedding technique you choose. And the choice of embedding method will really depend on the specific characters of your time series data and the machine learning task you want to perform. Um, and we got pretty good results with this method. So um, it's worth trying that out as well as other ones like time to vec, for example, could be used here to replace this step. 
So we're going to start by grouping the six months of data for this first sensor into windows of size 24. And we're also setting a step size of 10 here, meaning that's going to be the overlap of each window. And if we define this then as a windows, and we take a look at the windows variable we've just defined as a result of this, we'll see what we get is um, 24 values starting from the very first one to the 23rd index here. And we've got those values grouped and then you see our second window here um, is the next set. And it's interesting to note here because we set our step as 10 up here, that is why our second window is starting at 10. So there is an overlap here. So next we can iterate through each of these groups of windows um, extracting the start time, the end time, and the list of those 24 values we've seen. So if we do that here, we can then create a new data frame of these values where each row is one of those windows. So if we run that and then take a look at our data frame, we see we've got from zero to 23, which is 24 values here, all listed in one row, and then moving on to the next window and so on. Okay. Now the time series is split into overlapping windows um, and that means we can treat each window as a separate sample, we're going to apply a normalization and this ensures that the sensor values are scaled uniformly between 0 and 1 which is better for further analysis when we're saving these values down to KDB AI. So we're defining a function called normalize vector to do this and we can see once we've ran that our vectors are oscillating between 0 and 1. Okay, that's it. Our embeddings are ready. Um, we're going to save these to KDB AI in the next step. So we'll need the KDB AI URL endpoint and key from the cloud portal, which I showed at the beginning. And we're going to connect these using the session command. So if you haven't got those yet, you can go sign up at KDB.ai, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video. I've set this beforehand just so that my credentials are kept private and we can move on to defining our table schema. So this is where we'll select the kind of in index and metric that we're going to use for searching as well as defining any metadata that we want to add. So we want to add two se separate columns called start time and end time capturing the beginning and end of those windows that will just make it nicer to filter later on and then we're also going to define our vector column here. So when defining our index we need to make sure to use a dimensionality that is the same as our window size which we are doing we also specify our similarity metric at this point. We're using L2 here or Euclidean distance. And then the last thing we need to do is set the index. So we're choosing to use the HNSW1. So for more information on these types of metrics and indexes, you can check out on kdb.ai. We have specific articles on all the metrics and indexes you can use as well as our documentation site. So let's define this. Now we have an extra cell here, just checking if the table already exists. I've run this sample a few times before, so it might exist. So I'm just gonna run this so it will delete it. And then we can create our table using create table function. And um, we're gonna give it a name sensors and pass it that schema we've just defined above. Now we want to insert our data to this table. And it's a good idea to check the size of your embeddings data first, um, as if it's really large, it might be best to add it in chunks. So if we have a quick check here, we'll see it's around four megabytes, which is fine. So we're going to add that all in one chunk into our table. There's steps in our documentation site on how best to chunk um, if that is something you need help with, if your data set is a lot larger, just to be aware of. Okay, now our data has been added. We can query it and we can see we now have our data persisted in KDB AI. Great, so let's perform our similarity search on our historical data. The first step to do this is selecting a historical pattern that we're going to use as a query vector. And in this one, we're just choosing a random start time of like 1 p.m. on the first um, of the fourth. But you could change this to be any time window that you want. And we're going to select the historical pattern as well here. This is just for visualization so we can take a look at it before we run our search. So doing some matplotlib functions here, we see this is our query pattern. So this has got 24 points in it, it's our vector and it's oscillating around 2.45. So um, this is a pretty stable period in the, the pattern. Now you could change this to be any pattern you want to search for. 
Um, but let's start with this one. So to do search, we can simply use the embedded versions of this pattern. So we can select that. We do this above here, just selecting from the embedding data frame we've created. And we're able to run search on that against KDB AI. So we're asking for the five nearest neighbors here. And we see we get that returned in our table. So we get our KDB AI table with this nearest neighbor distance returned. The first result here is actually a query pattern. Um, as we selected a query pattern that existed in the data set, it's obviously going to give nearest neighbor distance of zero. Now you could remove this if you didn't want to see it. Um, for us, we're going to visualize in the next section. So it's actually useful to see the original query vector to compare. So let's visualize this and we're going through and we've just defining our functions here for visualization. And what we get is remembering the first result, as I said, is the actual query one. So the NN one in blue, that's our query one along here. And the rest are the nearest neighbors or the closest matches of our historical data after that. So I think we can safely say that we're getting some very similar results here. The overall pattern is matching quite closely with the matches found and the spikes and then the drop offs are happening pretty much exactly at the same, same point in time. Okay. So that's a pretty good result for a fairly easy to implement um, embedding model. And we can try another query vector just to see, does that hold up? So I just put this all in one cell just to make it easier to rerun. We're just choosing a different start time here, um, but otherwise everything is the same. So this is the start time we're choosing in on the 12th instead. And we take a look at this and we see again, the blue line is a query vector and everything else is looking quite similar with the spikes and drop offs happening again in pretty much the same place. Um, we can do things as well, like filtering um, the results on the additional columns we added. Like I mentioned, we added our start time and end time. So if we pop back up to our query and we wanted to do that, we could add something like a filter in here. So let's do that. So for this, we're saying we want to search for the five nearest neighbors, but only after the start time of this. So this is only going to look for August. So we shouldn't get any results in like April, um, for example. So if we rerun our query here, we'll see we do indeed filter just for anything after the first of the eighth. So that's pretty powerful. Um, and you can really use this to hone in on a specific period in time that you want to run similarity search for. And it's worth noting that this is pre-filtering happening, meaning the filter happens before the search. So in cases with really large historical data sets, this can be a really powerful way to speed up your search because you're only performing the search um, after the filtering has happened. Okay, that's it for this video. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel to keep up to date with all the latest from KX. Thank you.